of giving what we can speaking to us. Um, but first, he will be introduced by Julian Savalescu of the Ihero um, Center for Practical Athletics. Thanks very much. How long do you want to introduce for? Uh, okay, I'll, I'll do short of that. So I came uh, here in 2002, and it's, um, Oxford is a very difficult place. Um, and when I first came here, it was just me and then Nick Bostrom uh, I met. And at the beginning, it was really banging our heads against a brick wall. I remember oh, that we had... To, how many people here are from the philosophy faculty? Okay, all right. Well, this is confidential. Don't mention these stories. <laughs> And so you know, I came here, and then um, we we were we were overseen by the philosophy faculty. And um, I remember once we I eventually got some of our donors to, to give quite a significant amount of money, so they were being admitted to the Chancellor's School of Benefactors. Um, but the head of the philosophy faculty at that time was very keen to make sure we weren't running them up. So he he um, created a whole bunch of rules to make sure that we weren't. Um, Siphoning up money from the university. And one of these rules was that we had to be, have every single gift approved by him personally. And um, our donor was about to give uh, three million pounds to the university. And um, we'd already had approval for a, a, a desk set. And, um, and this was going to be presented to him. And so I, I said, well, we should get some pencils for this desk set. And my second time said, well, you've got to get Chairman's approval for the pencils. I said, but it's just a dozen pencils. Said, no, no, you've got to get approval. I said, I'll pay for it. It's all right. So eventually we paid for them. We got the desk. The, and he went with ballistic about the uh, pencils because this was going to be a pencil scab. And one of the other things that was hugely depressing when I came back to Oxford because I was here as the postdoc was everyone was talking about exactly the same thing as they were in 1995. What is the concept of a reason? Maybe some of you are working on the concept of reason. But uh, it's a hugely important topic, but it doesn't require 30 people to work on it each year. And um, I was very, very kind of depressed about this atmosphere. Um, and uh, I've been depressed about many things about us. But one of the great things has been Toby. Um, I think he has been really one of the outstanding successes of Oxford. And his events tonight, I think, is you know, one of the most exciting events uh, that's happening in Oxford because this isn't more of the concept of a reason. Now, what Toby has tried to do is actually apply great analytic philosophy to real practical problems. And this will be the future that people who are kind of ruminating about meta ethics and the concept of a reason and logic and so on will struggle with in the future um, because they're largely, they're hugely intelligent, but they're largely irrelevant. Um, and what Toby is not is irrelevant. And, you know, there are many things I don't agree with, with what Toby says, but one of the things that he does is he challenges you to, to think about your own position. And that, I think, is the success of real philosophy and real ethics. You know, if you think about the world, um, science is about describing the laws of nature, and, you know, we don't do that. The only area of philosophy that is distinctively important is not philosophy of mathematics, philosophy of of mind, philosophy, of biology. You know, biologists, you know, mathematicians and physicists know much more about those areas than philosophers do. They're irrelevant, really. They're just commentators. But the one area that we're not commentators on is moral philosophy. It's about deciding what we should do. Because no scientist, no physicist, no biologist, nobody can tell us what we should do. That's the area that we should be devoting our attention to in philosophy, and that's the area that Toby's devoting his attention to. And so, as I said, you know, there, I don't agree with Toby in lots of his areas, but he's caused me to rethink, you know, my own positions, and, and I said in one of my blogs that I'm supporting a child um, in Italy, it cost me £10,000 a year, and, you know, I can survive that. So I said, you know, when I finish supporting that child, I can devote that amount of money to doing other things. And that was because Toby made me think about you know, what my life was and you know, what I should be doing. So I think that's a huge success. So I think that what you're doing tonight is the most important thing that's occurring in, in not only Oxford philosophy, but Oxford academia. So it's a great privilege to introduce you. Thank you very much. Controversial, even in your introduction. So, so uh, I'll uh, probably not be able to live up to that introduction, but I'll, I'll see what I can do. Uh, it is an interesting thing that uh, uh, Julian is the uh, uh, chair of practical ethics in Oxford, and 
practical ethics uh, could be a lot of things. I mean, there's a lot of things that we could discuss as the ethics of. And uh, uh, I've done a lot of looking at the ethics of global poverty and thinking about donations and what our personal obligations are. Uh, and uh, tonight I want to talk a bit about the ethics of career choice. So, the question we have here is in, in which career can you make the most difference? And you probably are not really going to be leading to an answer here um, for a particular career. It will depend upon the person. But I want to try to look at it and really think about uh, career choice from a uh, kind of a philosophical point of view. So, let's start off uh, thinking about uh, your life. So, you each have about 60 years of life ahead of you. Uh, something like that. Okay, that, that's, that's quite a lot. Uh, and uh, it's a long time in which you can do great things for yourself and for others. Uh, for the purpose of this talk, let's set aside uh, all the great things that you can do for yourself in your life. All of the uh, wonderful uh, leisure time you can have, uh, perhaps your personal relationships and what you get from them and things like that. Uh, although there's, there's plenty that you will have there. Uh, and let's think about what you can do for others uh, in that period of time. So there are, when I think about this question for myself, I tend to divide it up into these, uh, these four different areas uh, of, of what you can achieve in your life. Uh, so that one of them is uh, was the uh, voluntary work. Uh, there's many things that you can do, taking some time out uh, and uh, uh, putting it into different types of organisations and societies that can help people in various ways. I don't need to explain that. Uh, there's your career, uh, what you can do there. There's personal relationships, um, so helping uh, your uh, friends and your family uh, through uh, difficulties in their lives and you know, just making the good times even better. Uh, and there's also, uh, on top of all of that, there's ways in which you can donate your money in order to help people who are in need. Now, normally when I talk about these things, I focus on donations, and I've talked a lot about that in the past, uh, but what I'm doing uh, tonight is talking about this different quadrant here. Uh, maybe eventually I'll, I'll get through all of them. So, when it comes to your career, uh, you'll spend something like 80,000 hours on your career. Uh, it depends on exactly uh, whether you meet the European Working Time Directive or not, and so forth, and, uh, and when you retire, when you start work. Uh, I only started uh, kind of a paid job when I was 30, so uh, I missed out on a few of these hours. Uh, but that's around about what you're looking at. And that's a lot of time, uh, and a substantial proportion of your life is going to be spent in your career. And so you really want to make sure that it counts. Uh, and it's really well worth thinking about this beforehand, uh, and taking it seriously, rather than just going with the flow when it comes to your career. Uh, with modern careers, there's often a lot of uh, changing uh, career choice halfway through, uh, compared to what there was 50 years ago. But it's still uh, well worth having some idea as to what you're really trying to achieve in your career uh, at the start of it. And if you think about this, uh, if you could improve the value of that 80,000 hours uh, by 1%, uh, so you could get done 1% more of what you find of value in that time, uh, then that would be worth around about 800 hours of thought uh, to work out beforehand how to do that. Okay, That's a lot of time, right? And 1% doesn't sound that hard to achieve. Uh, to really make that, that much better. Uh, so I do think this is the type of thing where it's very good value thinking about it. Uh, I also think that we can often improve the value by much more than that. Uh, in my case, I won't really go into this much, but I did some elaborate calculations as to how much I thought I could achieve over my career, uh, and that was particularly looking at what I could achieve by donating my income over my career. And I worked out how much I could achieve, uh, and then I ended up achieving 20 times as much of that in the first three years of my career by starting up by this organisation, giving what we can, and getting a hold of other people uh, to uh, donate their money, and uh, getting influence over organisations and government groups and so on, thinking about Title uh, IX. So it turns out that uh, uh, you can actually get quite significant improvements on what you think you can do. So uh, what we want to do now is spend an hour doing questions, uh, thinking about the big picture uh, regarding how much impact you can have in your career. Uh, so let's spend one of these 800 hours or so, and uh, maybe even in this one hour, uh, you can increase your expected value of your career by more than 1%, uh, which would suggest it's probably 